I had mentioned the Minnesota Starvation Project, whatever it was, experiment, I think it was called, uh, the other day, and people were asking me a bunch of questions. So I'm going to play, kind of kind of react to a video that I saw that was talking about this. So let's get started. I, I likely won't watch this whole thing. I will likely try to remember to link it in the description section. By our friend Kathleen. And so in this talk today, we're going to continue the discussion that we had from Kathleen's intro podcast from a few weeks ago. <clears throat> Definitely tune into that if you guys have not. She shared a very powerful healing journey to give everyone hope that healing is possible. And one of the main takeaways from that episode is the importance of eating enough food. And so that's going to kind of be one of the main. The, the main reason I'm making this video is because there is so many people who contact me and say that they feel like they need to just starve themselves. And I'm like, that is not the way. That is not the way. Now, if you are fasting or whatever for like a religious purpose, I'm not going to I'm not going to speak against that. But if you are fasting just for weight loss, I, I just it, it creates a really bad metabolism and just it, it's not great for the body topics as we move forward <clears throat> with more and more conversations with Kathleen we're going to be covering the Minnesota starvation experiment and so we're going to be splitting this up into several parts because we all believe it's very important and I think all three of us and I'm sure many of the audience have been negatively impacted by under eating for long periods of time in our lives. And so these experiments are going to help us break down why there are consequences to under eating. And so in today's uh, last thing I'm going to mention is I really, I keep forgetting to buy this book. I got to buy this book. I'm trying not to bring anything more into this house. Cause I know I'm going to be moving soon. I just don't know where yet. Uh, and, and make a video about it, but this, this will kind of hold the place of that episode we're going to kind of review a few important points from the last episode common questions that we received and give some background information as to what the minnesota starvation experiment was trying to accomplish and then in future episodes we'll dive into the results so kathleen hello how's it going <laughs> thank you for having me again i appreciate it it's it's going well i think a good place to start and I'd love to hear, hear Kathleen's take on this is why should people care about the Minnesota starvation experiment? I think that's definitely a great place to start. So basically some of the history behind the Minnesota starvation experiment is it was done in the 1940s. It was, um, let me see if I have the dates. It was from 19 November, 1944 to 20 December, 1945. So basically in the midst of yeah, World, War II. World War II. And the reason why they were so interested in what happens under um, starvation conditions. And I also just want to clarify, they use the term starvation, but it really wasn't a starvation. It wasn't like these men were fasting. Right. It wasn't like they stopped eating completely. They were eating um, during the starvation period approximately 1560 calories, so 1,560 calories per day, um, which nowadays a lot of people, even men, will say that that's all you need to eat. So um, that kind of puts this in perspective. It was more of a pseudo starvation experiment. A low energy availability state is the term that researchers use nowadays. I mean, this is the level of calories that people are telling like trainers and stuff are telling people to eat nowadays it's crazy i, I think 1900 calories was uh for the toddlers or something like that back in 1940 and now all of a sudden like you know like a fully grown person supposed to only do 1900 so so like i said it was during world war ii they were basically trying to see you know they they realized that europe was being decimated when it came to food availability. Obviously, the concentration camps. You also had the, um, was it the Dutch that, yeah, the Dutch and the Dutch airlift that ended up happening with the Red Cross and the uh, US Air Force or Army Air Corps at the time. Um, and so you had basically all of these questions about what happens when we're under these kind of pseudo starvation experiments, and then more so, how do you come out of them? Like, how do you rehabilitate someone after they've been in a quote starvation state? 
Um, so that, that was the reason, the justification for the experiment. I think it's important to note when you read these papers from 1940s, it, it literally says 3,000 calories per day is the normal human intake. Yes. And saying yeah. that number today is... That's what I've been telling people, and people think I'm crazy, but it's it, I'm not crazy. I had, you know, most, I think all of them are dead now, but I had family that grew up in that era, and I, they ate more than I did, all the, even in their 80s, and, and some of them into their 90s. <laughs> Yeah, it's so I saw it firsthand. It's frightening for people. People are literally afraid to eat 3000 calories. But in 1940, it was. I mean, some of some of my great aunts and uncles were like known for going up for two and three. Like if they came over for Thanksgiving or something, they were known for going up two and three times to get like, you know, two or three servings. And they were all thin and healthy and they all lived into the 80s, 90s. A couple of them really close to 100. Documented that that was the norm. Right. So then in these experiments, they took people down into a calorie deficit. And that was the pseudo starvation date. And that has somehow become the norm today in 2024 in these alternative health spheres. We're somehow normalizing 1,400, 1,500, 1,600, even 1,800 calories per day as that's fine and dandy. I, I was going to say, I understand that. People will say, because you probably have mostly women that listen to your podcast, right? And so they would say, well, but that's for men. And it's like, but you have to understand back then, the kind of range between men and women's weights was seemingly a lot closer than it is nowadays. So it wasn't uncommon to have um, a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, for example, be about the same weight, right? And so obviously men were have a little bit more muscle mass, a little bit more active. So they were eating a little bit more calories than women, but still it really wasn't out of, you know, the realm of possibility that women were eating much closer to the man's calories than what we consider today, what they would need. So Kathleen and I have talked about this. A very common number was the average male weight was 150 to 157 pounds. Right. And then Kathleen actually looked up on Google, like couple from early 1900s. And she, she sent me a picture of like a couple on the beach. And Sarah, they looked so similar in size, like the, the male and the female, the wife and the husband were very similar. And right. so th that is an important thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, my family was the same way. I mean, you know, it's completely changed now, though. And yeah. and obviously, sorry, Sarah, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. It's it's just funny to think, like, what society deems as, like, desirable now is, like, the man has to be massive, like, muscly, of course, and the female has to be very thin. So it's just gone in two completely different directions. Yes, yes. And, you know, obviously, the density interplays here right because the woman definitely had a little bit more fat mass which is normal right because she needs that high higher body fat percentage you know for children etc and they do talk about this in the minnesota starvation experiment that they um, expect and they also saw during world war ii and prior starvation events that women do tend to fare a little bit better because we do tend to carry more fat mass so you know that is a positive right that's something that is important to women but so, so, you know, they were about, they looked about the same, but obviously men carried a little bit more muscle mass, which means of course that they're probably going to need a little bit more calories, but again, not like these absurd differences that I think people believe there are between the two nowadays. So something that is important to note is I don't think that this experiment can ever be done again. Right. Because the ethics of this are so questionable. And so that's why I think. No way. There's no way. You know, people were humans back then. Now it's everything. You know, I can only imagine uh, what would happen. Uh, the Karens would come out of the woodwork. It's so important to document all the results because I don't think we're going to see anything like this ever again. And again, it took place in the 40s. And their main goal was to document the both the morphological and the functional changes brought on upon, they say the word starvation, but they really just mean undernutrition, calorie deficit for a prolonged period of time. Yeah. And, and so kind of a little bit more, um, the general setup. So they first did a 12 week baseline control, 
Um, people nowadays talk about that as like a standardization diet. Um, but even then, like nowadays, you would never see a 12 week standardization diet. Like there's just and this reminds me of that 50 50 plate that uh, McDougal talked about. You know, I had such terrible luck with that. I, I've had people email me and, and stuff saying I was lying about, about my uh, issues with the 50 50 plate, but I gained weight. I went from six. Six or sorry, two sixty five to two ninety two, doing the fifty fifty play. I you know I, a lot of that probably was water weight, but it really was it was terrible. Just not enough time for stuff like this. But they found that the average calories during this twelve week baseline control was approximately thirty two hundred calories per day per man, and there there is you know, individual variants because. And this is a man weighing 157 pounds. And I think the average weight back in that day was about five, eight. So if you can imagine, I'm not quite, I used to be six foot. I'm like under six foot now. And I, you know, I don't know what my weight is. I'm going to be doing that next week. You know, can you imagine the difference? Uh, it's crazy. It's not every man was the same height and weight. Um, not every man had the same muscle mass. And they, they were basically trying to figure out what is their maintenance calories and then keep them there. Some men, they did determine were slightly underweight. And so they brought them up slightly to what should be their normal weight. And there were a couple men that they determined were slightly overweight. And so they brought them down a little bit to what they would consider to be their desired weight for this time. Wasn't it uh, the college men? So it's younger men? Yes. So it was uh, 36 men. Um, they were specifically looked at to be mentally tough because they knew that this was going to be a big mental challenge, which they get into the psychology of everything that happens with lower calories um, in the MSC as well. And then people are going to bring up, oh, my gosh, this is men. Why can you how can you talk about the consequences to women? But I would say that if there are consequences to men. Yes. The consequences would be more severe for women. Yes, I agree. I mean, yeah, because women are going to automatically start storing more fat. And they in different chapters. For the most part. I do know some women who, when they're stressed out and stuff like that, they just go straight up anorexic. Of the Minnesota <laughs> Starvation Experiment, the book, um, they discuss, you know, the endocrine issues. They discuss the pastoral dysautonomia issues. I mean, Literally, it's amazing to me, but like some of the most kind of frequent symptoms, complaints, diagnoses, et cetera, that we hear about nowadays, they pretty much discuss it all. So, you know, I, I think this should be like a challenge to people out there. Um, if there's a specific issue that you are dealing with, a symptom that you're dealing with, please go to the chapter and give it. A I mean, literally every symptom in here that I've, I've seen, because I have like downloaded some of the PDFs of this book are what is caused by the starvation diets everybody's on. Read. I mean, it is somewhat technical, but like just kind of skip through the, t you know, the technical side of things, even the data, like that's how, what, how you should approach things that you don't understand the first time anyways. Um, and just read what they say and their descriptions and stuff. And, you know, I think you will find that it resonates a lot with you, even if you are a woman and not a man. I, me, me reading through it. I was like, <laughs> uh, yep. I've dealt with this. I've dealt with this. I've dealt with this. Ooh, this hits home right yeah. here. And if you don't want to go to the experiments, we are going to be touching on all these things over the next couple episodes. Um, but I would say that potentially Kathleen's hypothesis and edit this as you please is we've maybe brought on a lot of these health consequences that so many people deal with today due to being in a calorie deficit for a prolonged period of time. Right, right. And so you know, when they when I went into the calorie deficit, they basically did a 24 week starvation period. And what they did is they basically cut the calories in half because they were looking for each man to approximately lose 25 percent of their total body weight. Right. And they had them do two meals a day. So that kind of brings up some of these fasting protocols and stuff, too, because there were issues that they found with only eating twice per day. But. You know, I think the important thing is, is that someone's probably going to sit here and say, well, I haven't slashed my calories 50%. So this doesn't apply to me. But what, what happens if you were never truly at the high end of your maintenance range? And this will, will kind of go back to this um, about some of the. This is another thing I bring up with people, because when I lost all of the weight, majority of the weight that I've lost, which was about 150 pounds. 
I was eating an absurd amount of stuff. Now, it was raw vegan, but on average, I think I was eating between six to 8,000 calories a day. Keep in mind, I was over 400 pounds at that point. But yeah, the, the, yeah, I, yeah, it's crazy. I had come off keto carnivore type thing, and I, I think I was just so starved that it, it just was taken, it took its toll. The questions from the last podcast in a little bit, but what if you were never truly at that high end of your maintenance range and you are actually eating 50% of your maintenance calories? Um, and people will say, well, I am not losing weight. I'm gaining weight. And there's so many things that we can talk about that too. They talk about adaptive thermogenesis during the Minnesota starvation experiment as well. Um, so One thing that I want to point out before I forget is if you're retaining water, the one thing, and I, I like right now I am, I don't know if it's because it's like 97% humidity literally outside right now. I've noticed over the years that if I'm retaining water, I'm not eating enough because your body is going to store more water weight to kind of make up for the weight that you, because I don't think your body likes losing weight too fast. So I think it's kind of stores water weight. I don't know exactly how it works. But I noticed once I get to the calories that I'm supposed to be eating, I am peeing all day long and it's clear, right? When, when I'm peeing and it's yellow, I know something's off. So, you, and, but even if you're not eating 50%, say you're only eating like 20% under, there, you know, over time, that kind of um, subclinical pseudo starvation will build up especially because i'm i don't know about you guys i mean obviously both of you but like myself too pretty much everyone we ever talk to we are always cycling in and out of diets and you know kind of these low calorie phases and all that stuff and so over time these things build up and usually when we come out of these diets you know a lot of the times we go all in and like you know all these different things and it's not maybe the best nutrition plus of course all of the lean muscle mass that you sorry the lean tissue that you lose during the dieting phases and stuff so you never really like bring yourself back up to baseline is what i'm saying so over time this becomes more and more of a problem yeah so okay the essentially the minnesota starvation experiment wanted to see the effects of being in a severe calorie deficit so i think before we dive in a number that you brought up in the last podcast episode was 45 calories per kilogram body weight. Right. And so can you, can you talk about that? It, where did that number come from? And I think people are going to be frightened by that number when they do that calculation for themselves. I was. So what, what is yours, Sarah? Um, it's by kilogram. Yeah. Let's see. What is yours, Kathleen? So mine is way less than I actually eat. So I actually eat closer to 54 to 55 times my kilogram in body weight. Um, so Holy uh, shit. Yeah, mine is, let's see here. Holy shit. I just did the calculations. According to that number, I'm supposed to be eating around 5,800 calories a day. 5,850. Holy shit. Wow. Good God, I wouldn't even know how to get that much in, like, without eating. Oh, wow. Wow. Also, sorry, I've been silent the whole beginning of this episode. I'm trying, my ear headphone is like blasting you. So what? I had to like loop it around my ear. I'm like, I can't hear anything. <laughs> my, <laughs> no, it's not your fault. We, this happened last time. I can't figure out why my headphones are like high volume and yours are low. <laughs> That's actually the same issue I'm having right now. My calories are 2,800, but I eat more than that. And so, yeah, what is what is yours? My, so mine is uh, 2,352 and I oh, eat. Oh, wow. Yeah, I approximately about 2,800 to 3,000. Oh my goodness. Yeah. No, and people will say, okay, well, she's breastfeeding and I am breastfeeding, but even when I'm not breastfeeding, I still eat that much. So that that is my, my norm. And I, so, okay, we did this kind 50. of 45 number. What the hell am I going to have to eat? To eat? Uh, I should do this experiment. What the hell would I have to eat to get to 58? That is a lot. I'm done with my cellar sizer experiment on Sunday. Huh. I'm doing like these 30 days. Th you know, let, me, let me think about that. Man, it's a 
plot I don't... come from. So there's some studies that talk about like uh, nitrogen balance and all of this stuff. And and now there used to be this idea in bodybuilding that you should eat the calories for the weight that you want to be. So is that what this experiment or is that what this, you know, I think I'm going to reach out to this woman and see if I can get on her on because I want to know more. or this. They kind of give a range of 44 to 48 times a kilogram of body weight. And so I have just kind of over the years when working with people, you know, 45 is kind of like that first number that we really aim for. And I just, you know, it's just a number like th there are so many questions that come up when you give a prescription. Right. And so I just want to say, you know, if you're at 42, 40, like whatever it is, and, and you're feeling stuffed and you're like, oh, my, I, can't, I can't physically eat anymore, then like, please don't force yourself. And the, the other thing, too, is. Yeah, that, I wouldn't. Um, uh, that's the thing. I wouldn't force it. I really wouldn't force it. But I mean, it goes back to when I did the pound of sugar a day. Uh, after I had talked to Georgie Dinkov on that interview, or maybe it was before, I forget. I think that's one of the reasons we did the interview. Um, I was doing a pound of sugar a day. I think it was for about a month. And I completely corrected my thyroid and I doubled my testosterone over that amount of time. And I did do, I did just actually, it, this wasn't even done on purpose. I just happened to have my hormones tested on either side of this experiment. It just kind of fell into place like that. There's no way it's Friday. There's no way I could have my blood taken before and then. I don't know. I'm going to think about this, but I mean, I, I'm not going to force feed myself and I don't ever tell anybody to force feed. That was a durian rider thing. He told people to force feed themselves largely just because of uh, he was getting a lot of anorexics that were asking him questions. If you're anorexic, yeah, just force it in. But if you're not. When I say slow, I, I mean very, very slow when you're working towards this. And Yeah, and I wouldn't just all of a sudden do this. I'd have to figure out where I'm at right now. And then, and it's been varying uh, quite a bit lately. Largely because I've gotten too lazy. People, when they think they're going slow, they're they're going way too fast and they need to go slower. So we're talking about like adding an additional five to 10, maybe depending upon, you know, uh, men can add maybe closer to 25 to 50 calories per week. Um, so at yeah, the beginning, right. it's like, I mean, that, that progress right there, I don't, I don't know about that. That's a little really in the realm of error, right? Because we all know from tracking that like you're off, you could be off by like 200 calories and that be in the realm of, you know, normalcy basically. Um, so, you know, at the beginning it's, it's a very small amounts, but after a year, like doing that very slowly, you can see how you can finally get up. If I did do something like this, I would eat the most standard diet possible. So I, it would, it would literally be pretty much eating the same thing or same ish thing every day. Cause I'm not going to try to figure that out like every day. It's up there. Right. And you know, the, the number is also just a number two. I am more concerned about, or, um, the biggest consideration to me is again, finding that high end of your maintenance calorie range. <clears throat> so that's why. <clears throat> Sorry, that's why my maintenance calorie range or my maintenance calories are at 54 times because that's my high end where if I start eating more than that, then yes, I start to put on fat mass, etc. But and if I start to eat underneath that, then I will start to lose weight. The other consideration too, especially when it comes to women is you really should be tracking your weight month to month, especially based off your cycle. So don't compare, you know, your weight in follicular to your weight in luteal because they, they'll be different because of water weight changes and stuff. And then water weight swings happen all the time anyway. So you're really more looking more at the average. That's what's important because we really don't want to be putting on um, scale weights when you're doing this. We really want to find again that maintenance range, not the building range. So, so re really quickly. So if somebody had weight to lose um but they've probably had a history of under eating you're still going to want to use their current body weight to find this number before diving into some sort of weight loss regimen that's a good question so um in my view it should be your optimal body weight and then the question becomes well what what is my optimal and that that's a, an important question and you know 
I guess I don't necessarily have an answer. All right. Well, so that answers that question. So now let's, it's not going to be that much different. I like being in the t-shirts. I do not like. Being in the so 4950. 5,000. To that, other than I, I again, just don't like don't being be just, so yeah. beholden to the actual number, the 45 times, literally just slowly over time, continually slowly increase your calories and see what's happening over a week's time and see if it seems like you're putting on starting to slowly put on weight. And again, I just want to say too, if you wake up in the morning and you see like three pounds gained, that's water. Like even a pound gained, that's water. Like if you're going there, if you're adding five calories, 10 calories a week, and you wake up on Friday and you're like up three pounds, that's water weight. That's not, that's not fat that you just gained overnight. So you kind of can start to see like, okay, yeah, it really does seem like I'm gaining weight. And then that's how you kind of limit this. And the the whole point of us talking about this 45 calories per kilogram number is to just, I think it's an important, it's a, a good action item for the audience to do, to just kind of tune in and assess, hey, are you eating enough for your body? And I think that a lot of people aren't. And <laughs> tuning in with what you're, what you're eating on chronometer tracking for a little period of time and slow, very slowly. I have noticed that my, my recovery has not been what it usually is. That, that does kind of point to the fact that I'm probably not getting in enough calories. I got to calculate what I'm eating. I probably should actually start calculating a little bit. I hate this so typing. It hurts me increasing over time then that way you're not so fixated on your symptoms and diagnosing yourself and feeling like you're broken and instead maybe practicing some acceptance of hey maybe i've been in such a low calorie diet for such a long time that there are consequences to that 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 we will discuss and many people will say like oh i'd almost rather i know this is me though I'd almost rather just jump to that spot that you're supposed to be at and let everything kind of level out. But maybe that's not the right way. I don't know. Well, this is just like one experiment. Like, right. who cares? But in the, in the background section of this Minnesota starvation experiment, they talk about several other instances that doctors have reported, like at a French mental hospital or the Carnegie experiment. And they, they've all documented very similar consequences to slashing calories for an extended period of time of of these patients or uh, neil barnard talked about that in, a, in his book i got it over there uh too like is slashing calories is not a good idea um just various observations so it's not like this is just a one-time thing it's it's kind of a buildup of what doctors have collected to prior I know that so we've kind of built up to this. Can we talk about what the symptoms that arise tend to be? Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, it hits every single system in the body. Um, and, and so, like, I, I think this is actually very good news because I think based off of, you know, the first podcast and, and I also, you know, stepping back really fast, I had a lot of people message me and be like, well, what about this symptom? What about this diagnosis? Like, is it going to help me? And first of all, I, I don't I don't know. You know, it, it, I think it is a great foundation to work off of. I think that there are some, you know, amazing healing protocols and stuff out there, everything. I mean, there's so many different things that people can do. And also I will say placebo and nocebo are incredibly strong things, right? Um, but as at a minimum, I think working on this and getting this quote right is one of the best things you can do, at least from a biochemical side of things. Quick. So on, on that note, like all these symptoms and conditions, uh, an important quote that I wrote down, this is from the Minnesota starvation experiment is just, these are adaptive mechanisms protecting the individual organism from non-essential energy expenditure. Right. And so kind of understanding that the body is purposefully having to downregulate something that is not essential to the body staying alive because it's not getting enough energy in and just understanding that the body is a whole it has to keep you alive. So if you aren't getting enough energy and you can't expect all of the different organs and functions to work properly. Exactly. Yes. So. Yeah. And so I mean, I tell people that all the time. They want that bikini body or swimsuit body. But then, you know. It, 
they're so messed up that it's just not going to happen right now. Some people, like I said, asked me about, you know, what about these symptoms and stuff. And I also just want to say what we talked about last time, that was not my exhaustive list of symptoms and diagnoses. I mean, I have full pages more, um, but that shouldn't really matter, right? Because again, as you can see, this hits everything. So, you know, they, they talk about the morphological changes of what happens to your physical appearance, your body fat, your organ and tissue changes, um, so your viscera your endocrine gland changes and you know hormonal profile they talk about what happens to the heart and to the intestines uh, they talk about what happens psychologically you know uh, depression anxiety rumination um, thoughts about food control when i'm when am i going to eat let me sneak food um you know uh, kind of yeah so there's all of that side of the psychological side they talk about what happens to the skin and the hair the um bone and the blood um literally every body compartment and body system they discuss so i, I wrote down some general trends and again guys future episodes we're going to dive into these like in depth but from the minnesota starvation experiment and all these other like the carnegie and the french french mental hospital here were some trends that i wrote down tolerance for cold so always requiring more and more layers uh became very irritable very easily annoyed emotional instability less social so it's too much trouble or too tiring to content with other people and gosh that hit home for me yeah. kathleen that really hit home yeah, for me it is still like i, I feel like once you kind of go through that it almost becomes a personality trait of yeah. yours so i'm like yeah. still kind of working out of that one where it's like the thought of going to an event or to see somebody else is like kind of exhausting just to even think about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know about you, but um, I'd imagine this keeps you in fight or flight your entire life, too, which is kind of where I've been. Um, even the thought of like going to a big city at one point was like, yeah. I, I cannot do this. Like going to right. New York City, for example, or San Francisco, I was like, I cannot Ooh. do this. And a part of that's like the military side of me too, because I'm like constantly watching. And so the stress of, you know, constantly being on and stuff. But uh, yeah, it, I understand. <laughs> and then some other things. Um, so previously humorous, but then instead oh. becoming more sober and having a serious tone. That's so and, sad. Um, very low sex drive. So this was very consistent across all things. And something that I thought was very interesting is that numerous studies showed a significant de decrease in just the size of test testes right like 49 percent loss of weight from the testes right i actually wrote a quote how about how you measure i don't want to know i don't want to know i have no more sexual feeling than a sick oyster that was <laughs> that was something from i believe the carnegie experiment right right, right. oh boy so severe loss in <laughs> sex drive and can i just say really fast the carnegie experiment is way more resemblant of like what people do dieting wise right now so the carnegie experiment was to have them lose 10 percent of their body weight over a bunch of months and like these people like the, these men went full on into the diet and then they had like a period during uh christmas and new year's break where they're like we're just gonna eat whatever <laughs> and then they go right back into the diet again which is very again resemblant of what we do nowadays and they still had these kind of major changes thanks yeah yeah i i was gonna say like the a lot of what this is describing has been very normalized especially in different segments on social media like fitness industry bodybuilding like it, it kind of becomes your personality to just go to the gym and that's where you expend your energy and after that you kind of just I had that my entire life, my entire life, what lift I was going to have on the next. Lift. My entire life. That was my entire life. Stick, stick to yourself. And I feel like this has become almost like a culture and it definitely doesn't sound like what the human existence is supposed to resemble. At least when we talked to Suze last week in our podcast, she was talking mm -hmm. about the tribes and all these different um, Pacific islands. And their culture is all around re revolving around like nobody eats alone. They're always together. They're, they're, they're such a strong community network, whereas most of us are probably just like so exhausted and starved. We don't have the energy to even think of cultivating that community for ourselves. Well, Thanks. I on top of that, Sarah, I think we convince ourselves we are because when we eat, we have our phones out. And so we're scrolling yeah. social media or messaging people or whatever. And so and 
the reason why I bring that up is because your brain and even the um, emotional side and the intellectual side of your brain, just using your brain, uses so much energy that you see, like when you use your brain, you see changes to like blood flow, um, constriction, et cetera, to like your hands and stuff like that. And like I said, this is emotionally and intellectually. So if you're like scrolling social media, constantly being like, quote, triggered, or even just like smiling at like funny videos and stuff, like you're using all of that energy that now you're not, you don't have the ability to expend on people. And you're not actually with people using the energy with them. So, you know, there's, again, there's so much wrapped up into this, you know. Right. And then just a few other like similarities that I wrote down is just increased tiredness and weakness. Yes. Um, muscle soreness and cramps mm-hmm. Reagan, then this is a, a big one severe reduction in pulse rate and metabolism and body temperature which we've seen a very gradual de- mine on average is 96.3 i haven't done it in a while actually i don't even know if i've done it this year but last year i was doing a lot 96.3 decline over the last 100 years body temperature used to be 98.6 degrees fahrenheit and now it's closer to high 97s and then a big thing was edema and so the increased hydration of the body which is i think really hard thing for people to understand because they're losing weight yet the water percentage of their body increases and i know kathleen send us sends us these videos of these bizarre what it what is it explain what this is <laughs> well, we'll have to put these in the show notes i also have the paper talking about the 44 to 48 um calorie range that i'll, I'll send to you guys too it's so that we can put that in the show notes too but it's basically um this woman and her technique in europe i think i think she's in spain she does like clinics in i think spain france and italy um but it's this basically this like lymphatic massage technique and the amount of yeah, I mean, because I know I'm retaining water right now. I can feel it. it. It's different than fat. You know, you look at these women and they look pretty normal. Like maybe they have a little bit of excess fat on them, but like nothing out of the realm of like, you know, crazy or anything. They're not morbidly obese, but they do this like lymphatic massage and all of a sudden they, they look like they're almost emaciated, some of them, you know? And, you know, and I, I think the issue is, is that so, so people will slow. I can't find that in the, sh- the show notes, and I, I I don't know even where to look for. I did type in like lymphatic drainage massage, and I, I couldn't find this person. I really wish they would have put that in the, the notes. Look at themselves, and they'll say, "Well, there's no way. Like what I have on me is fat. Like I actually see rolls and stuff like that." But even with these women, like some of them look like before they have this massage, or they have rolls and stuff, and you would say, "Yeah, that's probably fat." But then after the massage, it's gone. Like, and the roll isn't there anymore. The skin's not sagging anymore, like all of that stuff. And so people think, well, how can that be possible? Because I think the reason why people think that is because I think people think that the body and cells are more like a balloon and filled with water. And so if I were to like push on the balloon, so like pitting edema, basically, if I were to like push on the balloon, I would move the water away and you would see this indent and stuff where a lot of people have non-pitting edema. And I think that's what is going on here is you have this non-pitting edema all over the place. And, you know, talking about um, the the low respiratory rates, the low pulse rates, the low blood pressure, the low temperature, all of these things seen in hypothyroidism. Well, originally hypothyroid. Yeah, I got a lot of that. <laughs> that's fun. Hypothyroidism was kind of looked at as mixed edema and oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, uh, the 4950, I'm going to write that down. I'm probably going to start ramping it, ramping it up today. Somehow. I, I'm one of these people that if I didn't have to sleep or eat, I wouldn't do it. I, I don't really like either one. With mixed edema, you also see this like very kind of vacant expression and like, no desire to want to associate with other people like you know all of these things um and with mixed edema one of the hallmarks of mixed edema is non-pitting edema all over the place um because you have mucous polysaccharides deposited all over the place and stuff and so 
you know, it, it's not the same as like a water balloon and pushing against a water balloon and me like being able to like slosh the water in my body and stuff like the water is associated in the, you know, the interstitial fluid, it's associated in the cells. You know, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but um, for example, say you have like a really high. This probably explains why this used to happen. So back in the day when I was into bodybuilding and I would do my dieting and I was still with my ex-wife at this time. Um, I would do my health, quote healthy diet during the week and she liked to go out to dinner. I mean, who doesn't, um, uh, you know, like either Friday or Saturday night or sometimes both. And we would go to this Italian restaurant. I know I've told this story a lot because I never could figure this out why this would happen. We would go to this Italian restaurant and these people, I swear, you had to have had a, a liter of olive oil every time you were there, no matter what you order. You could order water. I swear they put olive oil in that. But Sunday, I would start looking skinnier. But uh, by Monday, I would unload so much that I on, on a few times had to figure out how to flush the toilet. And I would weigh five to 10 pounds less on Monday than I did on Saturday. And I would be peeing all day on Sunday. And if I, w I wonder if that has something to do with the fact that, I mean, there was so much olive oil with the thing. Carbonated and I, I've salt. always stayed away from oil because I never, I never really liked it. Like, um, like pizza, for example. A lot of people, when they have pizza, the next morning they wake up and they feel slimmer. And they're like, oh my wait, gosh. how is this possible? How is that? <laughs> oh, that's crazy that I just, I, I haven't watched this far into this video. Cool. And... I think the reason why is because when you do that, first of all, all the glucose and then the salt is drawing the water into the cells and it's then the cells are structuring them because you're producing enough ATP, et cetera, because you have all this glucose coming in. And so you physically appear to be smaller and it's because now the water in your body is structured versus acting more like a water balloon in a way. So we, we can talk about that in future episodes, but- so that was just a very consistent, like across all of these different studies and a huge chapter in the Minnesota starvation experiment is edema. So just water retention. So as these people were losing more and more weight, they were losing muscle tissue, but the percent increase of water in their body was rising. Right. And that's another well, thing I said at the beginning of this episode. I've noticed that on myself and that's what, you know, you call it skinny fat. Oh, I'll go ahead, Sarah. So, oh no, I was just going to say that the phenomenon that you're talking about like eating the pizza and then looking thinner again back to the fitness world because i spent so long you know in that, in that community <laughs> that is seen so often where like a coach will say okay go take a cheat meal and the next day they wake up and they look even better like almost like they just shed five pounds of water yeah. i used right. to see but that really, in the bodybuilding like said, world it just kind of like structured everything and went to the right place so i've definitely witnessed that in in my own experience too. and i so so Sarah and I joke because we think Kathleen noticed this when we first jumped on, but I still have edema in, <laughs> yeah, so in my face. Tell the story. It's really funny to me. So we have like a, uh, we're on WhatsApp with Kathleen. She's helping us with some things. And she put in our documents like this, this lymphatic facial massage exercise. Like she put it in both of our documents almost immediately. Right after the last podcast episode. And so she didn't say anything about it either. Like no word. We just both happened upon it. And we were like, Kathleen looks at us and says, water log. Water log. Water log. <laughs> but like, I've uh, like, think, think back. Truthfully, if I think back, I've been lean my whole life. Yeah. But I've always had a big face, and I trust me, guys. There's like a lot of structure. I'm there, not self conscious about it. Like I don't care. But it's interesting to note that I've had edema in my face despite being very lean, like always six pack, like at, as a at a young age. And so this edema phenomenon, I still see it for myself. And I'm I'm not trying to like uh, say pity me. It's just it shows up consistently in these experiments. And then you start to look at people around you and recognize like, you know, yeah. some people probably have some edema and water log issues. And mine is always my torso. I, I know something's off with my torso. Like right now, you know, and I, it doesn't help the fact that it's literally 97% humidity out there right now. But wow. Wow. Kathleen, I'm, I'm curious on your thoughts because I know people are going to bring this up. Well, 
how can you say that people aren't fat? You know, like how can you just go ahead and say, oh, everyone's problem is water retention? Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, fat people, your your issue is inflammation. Now, why do you have it? You know, that's a different story. And and I'm definitely not saying that. I, I do want to remind people though that on average, people are making about 30 liters of fluid a day just from normal cellular processes and stuff. And most of that just gets you know, from the osmotic balance and stuff like that, it just gets sent back into circulation and, you know, we pee it out, like all of this stuff. And then like about three liters stay in these kind of like interstitial spaces and that's where the lymphatics pick it up. But if you have issues there or say um, for whatever reason, it's not coming back into circulation, which we can talk about in future episodes, why that might be happening, um, then you can see how more and more accumulates. And so, and you're seeing this with people, more and more people are being diagnosed with lymphedema, more and more people are being diagnosed with lipedema. I have stage one lipedema of my legs. It's something that I'm still, you know, working on. And I think this is a big piece. I just haven't got it right. And I've been thinking a lot about mechanisms. So if someone wants to have a conversation um, more on the scientific side. About I think I'm also going to figure out how to add more salt. I hate salt. Like I hate it. I, I hate like, there's things that I can't stand and people actually hate me for because they're like, I wish I had you. I don't like peanut butter. I don't like salt. I can literally eat one potato chip and, and just be done. I can, like, there are so many things that I just don't like that people wish that they didn't like. But then there's the other thing where if you put a thing of Oreos in front of me, I'll literally eat the entire package. So, I mean, you know, there's give and take here. About mechanisms, please message me because I'm always interested in these things. And the reason why I say that is because, for example, type 1 diabetics, when they become type 1, um, or if they're not really well controlled, they, they urinate a lot and they lose a lot of water really quickly. Um, that's like a hall hallmark of... I pee all the time, but it's always yellow. And then there's certain days where it's, it's clear, no matter what, I don't even have to drink. What, so I'm trying to figure out what the hell the difference is here. It's, it drives me crazy. Type 1 diabetes. And so there's something, diabetes. something going on there when it comes to insulin, potassium, aldosterone, et cetera, things that I'm still thinking about. But so back to your question, though. Yes, some of it is, of course, fat. I'm not going to say it's not. But a lot of it is also water. And you can see over time how that you can tell the increase. difference. And over time, how you might think you're putting on fat, but it might be a little bit more. Water weight is literally more fluid. You can tell the difference. And like, in like two, three days ago, I think it was, I could see the divide down my chest and I could see my first two abs. And this is at 260, whatever I am. I haven't weighed myself, but I'm guessing I'm in. Today it's gone completely. I mean, I can see my top two abs. That's it. But something's causing this, and I got to get to the bottom. More water. And I think, again, back to this, like, lymphatic um, massage Instagram account, like, I think a, lo a lot more. But if you think of somebody, I know I'm really interrupting now. Don't get mad or get mad. Whatever. Give me a thumbs down. That always helps the video. Um, if you think of somebody like Brad Pitt, I, I, like, I... I've watched a lot of his movies over the years, and he's eating in every single one of them. And the dude, it, you can see, I mean, every fiber of this dude's being, you can see uh, under his skin. It's crazy. People would be truly astounded to realize like how much water they actually have in their body. And I don't know of any good um, imaging other than the MRI. So. And most doctors are not going to say, yeah, go get an MRI to see <laughs> if you have a cities, which is like fluid <laughs> accumulation in the abdomen and stuff. You know, um, I think. I think the DEXA like will give you a calculated water score, but in my experience, that is not at all um, accurate because it's again, it's just a calculation. It's not actually reading, you know, the water in your body. So, and but again, I will say some people do have too much fat, and of course they they you know it would be helpful for them to get some of it off and to. Yeah, I'm not I'm not going to come on here and say that I don't have fat, and other people who are are, are overweight don't have fat on them. But I, I actually was talking, about, I think it was just last year already, to somebody um, on Instagram about this, and we were both talking back and forth. You can tell when it's water weight, and you can tell when it's fat. Like, fat is just, it's, I don't know, it's like this weird consistency, but water just, it's very fluid underneath the skin. 
you know, come back into a, a more um, healthy body fat percentage. And I think that's where things like lifting, you know, not kind of doing the under eat, overeat, staying with like consistent calories, that's where that comes in. And, but I think a lot more people have a lot of this water issue. And, and again, like I understand this one Instagram account is just one example, but there are numerous lymphatic accounts out that are popping up daily talking about lymphatic massage and how to, you know, we got to get on the vibrator plates. We got to jump up, you know, jump on the mini trampolines to get the lymphatics moving and stuff. And um, so I think people are realizing this is a problem. I think one of the biggest issues too, is if you are already waterlogged and you do jump on the trampoline, your body's already not getting rid of what you bounced off from the day prior so it's just going to store that in water too because if your blood is not i think it's i've heard both i've heard seven point if your blood's not a 7.33 or a 7.4 pre-age you're dead so it can't have this inflammation stuff in the blood system otherwise you're dead so it's going to put it somewhere and it's going to store it most likely in water or fat but most likely water that way it can get rid of it when you're in a, a better state so you might actually just be causing more water weight by doing some of this stuff <laughs> because I, I, can't, I can't figure out, you know, that's the only thing I can think is, yeah, is that. Problem. And but again, I have nothing to back it up. Because we're under eating, well, I think that's why you're seeing more and more need come because more and more people are under eating. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we'll dive into this in a, a, a future podcast, but. I think it's okay to want to lose weight. Like that is okay. And there are people who are overweight and do need to lose calories, but where we shouldn't be is in a state where you're always trying to diet. Exactly. And that just seems to be a uh, normal. If my actual weight is for a uh, calorie count should be 4950. I have been severely under severely. I honestly don't even know how to get up 4950 without adding sugar. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot. Normalized, accepted. And so you can see this consistent trend of people under eating, under eating, under eating, under eating, and then binge. Right. And then under eating, under eating, under eating, under eating, binge. And so that's just not going to lead to a well-functioning body and potentially more water retention and at the end of the day it's not going to lead to the desired physique or body function changes that we want to see and instead being at a consistent calorie range that's appropriate for your body weight for a period of time and doing a planned calorie deficit where you lose body fat for and be in that period of time for it's short it's not an right. extended 12 month thing exactly. get in get in and get out that's okay well but you say that people are constantly in this like under eating diet, like mindset, but I think a lot of people actually aren't even in that mindset. They're just under eating because that's what they normal do. now. Yeah. It's not even like that. Like I can name a few people off the top of my head who eat 1600, 1700 calories a day and that's their normal and they maintain their weight there and they're happy with that, but they just don't recognize that all the different symptoms that they're dealing with might be coming from that calorie load day in and day out. Whereas these studies in the 1940s documented that the average human calorie need is 3000 calories. And now we're normalizing 1600. Right. And, and so people say, again, that's for men. Well, for women, it was 2,500. So we're talking about like approximately 500 calories less. So was that you know, for women just like flat out women or was that, you know, cause I, it, like you said, you're breastfeeding and that's requires additional calories. So I imagine it would only go up from there. And this is kind of just the standard yeah, sedentary. Was, yeah. It was oh, sedentary. The, so I would say that was the average, um, based off of the, uh, the tables I've seen for more like truly sedentary. And I think people need to be honest with themselves. Like, are you actually sedentary? I'm sorry. If you're a mom, you're not sedentary. <laughs> so like, yeah, you know, I think people need to really be honest with themselves, but um, for truly sedentary, it was closer to 2000 to 2200. So we're still talking about you're in the 2000s. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, and then it an average woman was about 2500. And 
than a breastfeeding woman or, um, uh, you know, pregnancy was 2,800 to 3,000 calories. Um, and, and also this is just averages, right? And back then, again, weights were a little bit more clustered around each other. So, you know, the, this doesn't account necessarily for the more muscle mass you have because building muscle is a big thing for women nowadays. So you have to take that into account. This doesn't account for, you know, your height, or age, you know, all of that stuff. So, and, and I also wanted to say too, this does still apply to women who have gone through menopause as well. So, you know, just because you're at a different phase in your life doesn't mean that you all of a sudden like need to be under eating or, you know, even though you don't necessarily believe you're under eating, but in a way you are under eating. So, yeah. And then, so just to really finish, uh, really quickly finish up the general overview of the MSE um, before we run out of time, the last 12 weeks was a controlled rehab experiment for all 36 men. And then, um, and so for the, that controlled rehab, they split them up into, um, they added 400 calories, 800 calories, 1200 calories, and 1600 calories. They basically really quickly found out that most of these were not enough. And so for some of these groups, they had to add 800 more calories back in. Um, and then they also split them up and gave them a, uh, some, uh, some of them additional vitamins and some of them additional protein. And we will discuss that in the future because this really gets into, I think, what we're seeing with this whole push for everyone needs more protein and this whole pu uh, push for why it seems like everyone is trying to out supplement their diets nowadays. Um, yep. yeah. And then after the 12 weeks, most of the men left, but there were still some men left over that stayed for an eight week unrestricted rehab. And during this unrestricted rehab, the, they could eat ad libitum. So they could eat however much they wanted, whenever they wanted. And the highest uh, that the, it, there were a couple men, well, pretty much all of them ate even higher calories. And the highest calories that they tabulated was 7,800 calories a day. I've been there. Because that is how or that work um i've been there i've been there i i people think that i i that i couldn't do i was like, i was eating it was crazy unsatiable appetite after. and that's when i lost 150 pounds but i was over 100 this ferocious and, and so basically we we are going to dive into the consequences of the Minnesota starvation experiment on what happened to these men when they were at these low calorie states, which are now normalized, these 1600, 1800 calories. I was looking at my phone because I was pulling up from this 1915 book or women at light labor were supposed to eat 2700 calories and children of nine years old were supposed to eat 1900 calories. Or So what are the consequences of us under eating. And then she just said the word rehabilitation. So basically coming out of those low calorie states. And so what I'm excited about is we can talk about the, what, what the researchers noticed as they increased calories and then the takeaways there and how we can help you guys safely come out of these low calorie states without severe repercussions. Yeah. Right. And, and again, I just want to emphasize too, None of us are saying that no one needs to lose fat mass because I think oh, yeah. some people I might mean, listen to this and I mean I definitely have it, but I like I can tell when it's water weight. And I don't want to go too crazy because I have been losing weight, but I don't want that to be because I'm starving myself. So I gotta figure out that that life there. Take you know, a blurb or whatever, and just say, oh, these women are just telling you to eat more calories and everyone's under eating and you got to get to this number and stuff. And none of us are saying that. And Again, I have been losing weight, but I've got a lot of extra water weight that I didn't have before I started losing weight. And it goes back to when I this, when my chiropractor back in PA had me riding bike, I had this happen. He's like, dude, you're just not eating enough. You got to start like just eating just eat and i did and that is a, that that summer was miracle uh, was a miracle i couldn't believe how much weight came off it was sick too, and i've never been able to replicate and i wonder if you know anyway there is a time and a place to lose fat mass however i would i want you to do it from a nourishing standpoint i think for example um uh, juan on instagram juan, juan d wellness i think is her handle She's a little bit older and she works with an older clientele of women, but she always says like, 
I will not put you in a deficit until you can prove to me that you're at maintenance and you're you are crushing maintenance and you're at a stable weight and you know strength is going up and all of that stuff. I ended up having some kind of weird technical difficulties that just stopped recording. If you made it this far, let me know and maybe I'll make another uh, v version of this. I am going to reach out to her and see if I can do an interview with her because I think that would be probably best. It may be a long interview, so I'll have to split it up. But uh, yeah, I think that's a lot of good information. And I really do think that we need to take this into account that we may have just not eaten enough, you know, because a lot of these symptoms from not eating enough are symptoms that people have, especially I see a lot of DMs. I see a lot of comments. I see a lot of that kind of thing going on. And a lot of it is what these, these women were talking about. So anyways, uh, as always, sorry, man, all over the place with this as always like subscribe and I'll talk to you in the next video. Thumbs up, share the video. Do all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one.